So, um, okay, so recording has just started and I uh, welcome you to our training webinar on best practices for outreach with blindness or visual impairments. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Christine Janet Enza. I am um, one of the members of the IAU Inclusive Outreach or the Inspiring Stars Working Group. Um, uh, to begin our session today, uh, I'll just uh, say a few reminders for all of us, our house rules. So please note that the call will be recorded or has been recorded, recording now, and it will be published on the, the IAU channels, mostly in our Facebook and in our YouTube channels. And then you are kindly requested to turn off your mics and to interact via chat while the presenter is presenting. And please do keep your webcam on. So please, um, uh, if you're comfortable, you can uh, join us in a uh, webcam so we, can, so we can see your faces. And then you are more than welcome to ask questions and to interact during the webinar, of course. Uh, after the talk, we, can, we will have a discussion or we will have an open forum uh, for your questions and for us to network. All right. So before we start, before I present our speaker for today, I will call uh, Cesare to introduce our inclusive outreach working group. Cesare, thank you. the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Cristina. Uh, I'm Cesare Pagano, amateur astronomer in Italy. And uh, uh, together with Andra Stoica, who is also on the call, uh, we uh, coordinate the uh, inclusive outreach uh, 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 work group, as Christina said. Uh, and I thought to spend just two or three minutes, no more than that, to, to introduce the group, and then we will go to the contents of the webinar. So a few words about the inclusive outreach and what we mean by that, because inclusion is a broad term, by definition, it could be applied to many contexts and many dimensions. In our work group, we selected to focus on some specific aspects of inclusion. So for us, inclusive outreach is about giving people with disabilities equal opportunities to access astronomy outreach resources. In fact, access to scientific culture is an important element of societies. So this equal access is very important. Uh, we can say without exaggerating that it's a matter of democracy. And we found out that there are many individuals, associations, many institutions uh, that over the years developed skills, uh, tools, and experiences on inclusive outreach around the globe. And several of, of them are on this call. Uh, some are very, very creative uh, uh, ways and, and tools to explain the Earth movements, uh, eclipses, constellations to blind people or to allow telescope observations from wheelchairs, or how to best host an online session that to be accessible to people with visual and hearing impairments and so on. So the thought is that if all this experience and knowledge can be put together and made effectively available for everyone to use, this could be an incredible asset for the global community. So this is where our work group comes into play. So on the next slide, just a few uh, words about our sub work group. It's part of the International Astronomical Union. Uh, uh, it's a, a sub work group of the Executive Committee Work Group of Astronomy for Equity and Inclusion. And the very goal is to facilitate and promote the development and adoption of inclusive practices in the astronomy outreach activities worldwide. So this is the shortest I could keep <laughs> the introduction. Uh, at the end of the session, Christine will share some contacts uh, and Mike, I think, will say something more. So there will be ways to stay in touch. But for now, I would stop here and give the, the, the stage back to Christine to, to move forward. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, Cesare. All right. So if you're ready, we can start our presentation. So grab a cup of coffee, tea, or any drinks that you like. For, for today, and feel free to share the link to your friends, colleagues, so that they can uh, also interact with us or they can also uh, see our presentation for today. All right, so moving on. So we are very happy and we were very happy to introduce you to our speaker for today. 
Ken Quinn. So Ken uh, is currently currently lives in Erie, Pennsylvania with his wife and three children. And Ken serves as the lead tactile evaluator for Haptically Speaking, a company that produces tactile astronomy books for NASA. For over 22 years, Ken has assisted NASA with improvements in tactiles that are used in their astronomy books. Ken holds a degree from Edinburgh University, now Penn West University, in secondary education and criminal justice. Quinn also is contracted by Associate Universities Incorporated to make science more materials more accessible for all abilities. All right. So without further ado, I will give the floor now to uh, Ken. Thank you very much. Um... I want to let everybody know I'm definitely willing to talk to you about how you can make your facilities accessible to all people with all different abilities. Um, however, today my talk is going to focus on blindness and visual impairment. Uh, many of you would like to welcome more visitors to your facilities that are blind and visually impaired. However, your presentations don't always allow that to happen. So today we will assist you to inviting visitors with blindness and visual impairments to your events and your facilities. At this point in time, I'm going to pause and give the floor to Dr. David Hurd to talk about his experience with blindness and visual impairment and how he came into the world of tactile astronomy. Thank you, Ken. Uh, first of all, uh, if you didn't know, Ken, Ken is blind. He'll probably come back to that. And he was a student here at uh, Pennsylvania Western University some time ago. And uh, but just very briefly before I turn it back to Ken. Yeah, it was probably 25 years ago now, maybe 20 years ago. Uh, I was here at Edinburgh and my dean came to me and said, hey, you're going to have a student who's blind. I said, no, I'm not. He said, yes, you are. I said, no, I'm not. He said, yes, you are. And I decided, well, I want to keep my job. So I better go ahead and say, bring them on. So as they say, the rest is history. Okay. I had, I run the planetarium here at Edinburgh and that's a very, very visual environment, a very visual teaching environment. And so we had to come up with some very creative ways to give that accessible experience, that inclusive environment, so that uh, the student who happened to be blind could get the same bang for the buck out of my class. And since then, I've worked uh, directly with Ken and my colleague, Cass Runyon from College of Charleston, and our colleague, Joe Minofra. He's at NASA Ames. And uh, the four of us have produced many, many books for NASA on uh, or about tactile astronomy, including our most recent, which is on light pollution that we're very proud of, and the uh, eclipses coming up in uh, North America in 2023, 20, this year in the Southwest United States and down into South America and the 2024 eclipse, which is also uh, in North America. So if you're interested in those resources, after I quit here in a minute, I'm going to put the website for our books uh, on the chat. Ken? Um, David, real quick. Um, I know you have some time restraints today, but I know a lot of people when they think accessibility, especially astronomy and tactile stuff, think, oh my goodness, it has to be really difficult, complex, expensive to produce, um, need you know, high equipment such as swell touch machines, thermoform machines. Um, can you kind of talk about how you first started out, especially with that first student and what you did to make your program accessible? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we were fortunate at that time, we actually had an office for students with disabilities and somebody who was designated to do uh, tactiles for students that were blind. So I coupled up with John Mate Matelock, who has since retired, and he and I started to create these tactiles. But as Ken mentioned, at first, it was, it was just simple stuff, 
using paper and a um, a wheel with with spikes on it, I guess a sewing machine wheel or fabric wheel or something. And we would draw simple diagrams with that to produce bumps on the other side of the paper. So just starting out simple is the key because giving your participants just something they can have in their hands is huge to, to try to level the playing field. It maybe doesn't give them the same experience, but what we're after today is just to say, try it, okay? Be a pioneer and whatever you try, keep it simple and try to look at your uh, uh, lessons, look at your shows, look at your programs, look at your education material and decide what are the key points that I want my students to leave here today with. And I think that's what you got to keep in mind to make this stuff more accessible. All the other stuff is frills and can go aside, but we need to focus on what is it that I really want my students to grasp today that you need to focus on and make accessible. Ken? Thanks, David. So some things to keep in mind, especially with when it comes to regard to your website, is have information about the plan that your visitors are going to be doing. Um, especially if you have to have accommodations scheduled ahead of time. So have that available on your website, on your order form when they sign up for your event. If you are doing field trips, um, also have that same spot on that form for the field trips for them to fill out. And if and ever, wherever it's possible, have them be able to reach out to you or you reach out to them to find out what exactly the students in that field trip or the individuals in that um, field trip need to make the event more accessible and more meaningful for them. In addition, uh, most people, when you come to your place, they might have a picture of here's what our whole place looks like it'd be helpful to have a written description um, as detailed as possible to um, about your facility. So some might think it's hard to make your website accessible. And by accessible, I mean accessible for what we call screen readers. A screen reader simply is what it sounds like. It reads what pops up onto your screen, whether it is being typed by the user on the keyboard or if it's showing up in a web search. So the main things to keep um, in mind is to be W3 compliant. And there are several websites that I've um, shared that will be coming in the chat that you can go to those and you can test your website for accessibility and they'll tell you what you need to do to make your website accessible. Um, and once you're W3 um, accessible, um, you're accessible for all. So some of that would include having alternate text for your picture. So there's a description to go with your pictures, having closed caption and audio description for videos that you have on your website, um, having buttons on your website labeled. But the W3 um, website that is shared in the chat is very direct and will be able to assist you in re regards to making your website accessible. So when we talk about exhibits, we want to make sure that they're shareable to all and that everybody can get a meaningful experience out of it. Both people that are fully sighted, fully able to move, um, as well as those that are visually impaired with low vision or that are totally blind. So just some things to think, keep in contact with those individuals who are coming to your facility that might have low vision is that they might have to get closer to the exhibit or the size of the print might be needed to be enlarged. So if you're making something, you wanna basically think of universal design principles. And so if you're printing something out, a good rule of thumb is to make it 18 point font um, or higher, uh, but a, a good 
good size would be 18 point font, somewhere between 18 and 24 and in a sans serif font, because um, those sans serif fonts are easy to be read. Also, if your exhibits, if they're gonna be interactive, you wanna make sure that they're accessible to all, no matter what their abilities. Um, to think about somebody who is low visioned or totally blind, um, if it's especially an interactive display and you have lots of things going on, you would wanna have those things on a tray with sides so they can't roll all around the table. If there's an exhibitor there assisting with that exhibit, um, you'd want them to be able to describe how things are placed. So top, bottom, left, right, or also using the clock face because um, every person that's visually impaired or blind are very familiar with those types of layouts. When using things as most as possible, I know when we talk about astronomy, it's hard, but other sciences, it's easier to do this with, to use physical things that are real whenever possible. Um, some other things to think about to have on hand at your facility would be to have, other than detailed descriptions of your facility, would be a tactile map if you have one, um, a large print map, or even Braille, just describing your facility. Also, if you're doing a talk or involved with the group, it's always good to let the low vision or blind individual know when you're there, your name, and then when you're leaving, so they don't continue to talk to you. So everything that I've covered up to this point, um, you know, talks about blind and visually impaired, but also is universal design. If we design it, for those that have no ability to see or low ability to see or inability with movement, then we designed it for everybody. So everybody will have an ultimate experience at your facility. You obviously wanna make sure that you are describing the exhibit in a way that the individuals that are visiting will understand. Um, if you're giving descriptions to where things are laid out, especially if you're giving directions, you wouldn't want to say go over there or and point. You would want to say um, you need to go to the planetarium. Okay, go ahead and walk down this hallway. When you reach to the end of this hallway, you want to make a right. Go down to the end of this hallway and on your left will be the door to the planetarium. If you're assisting somebody with walking with them, you're going to want to do something called sighted guide. Sighted guide is not holding their hand. It's allowing the person to take your elbow and you walk slightly in front of them and they follow behind you, um, either using their cane or their guide dog um, in a healing position normally if they're going sighted guide. Um, if there's any questions regarding sighted guide, I'd be happy to talk more in depth about that. Um, when talking to a person who is blind or visually impaired, you always want to speak directly to them and not to their companion or individual who may be with them. Um, also, just because they're visually impaired does not mean that they're deaf, so you do not need to scream to them. Um, only time you would change this is possibly if this person is deaf blind and does not do any type of finger spelling or if you don't know sign language. Also, make sure to just talk to them like you would talk to anybody. Um, you want to use, you know, C and blind. It's no different than talking to anybody else who's sighted. Also, it's very important to, if they have a guide dog, to not interact with them, not distract them, um, because they are doing a job. They're not to be fed, pet, talked to, and you always want to talk to the handler um, first. It's, they're a team, and they work very well together as a team. 
Um, the equivalent to you touching a working dog when they are in harness is the equivalent to you covering your eyes and walking down the center of a street. Um, that's how dangerous it can be for the team. You know, some things specific to astronomy and how to make things accessible. Like David touched on, you can do things with tracing wheels, with yarn, glue, puff paint, as long as it gets to the individual, the meaning that you're trying to convey. Um, some more advanced features are swell touch machines. The swell touch machine allows you to take a carbon pen or carbon ink in a printer, print on a special piece of paper and run it through this swell touch machine. And when the swell touch machine brings it out, it's now a tactile graphic that you can feel. If you know how to convert print into braille, um, use an ASCII text. You can also put Braille on that same document. So you have Braille in print. Um, those machines are a lot cheaper than a thermoform machine. However, the paper is pretty expensive. Um, if David is around, he could probably talk more to the, the price point on that. Um, with regards to thermoform machines, the way this process happens is you make a master copy, um, which takes several, several hours. And it's just not like, oh, I want 60 more. Let me just put it on a copier. Um, the way you work with a thermoform machine is you make a master with all different textures. You put that master on the thermoform machine, which is a heat pump and a um, vacuum pump. You put a piece of plastic on top of it. You close the door, the heat and vacuum take whatever's on that master, including Braille, if you put Braille labels on it and imprint it into that print, into that piece of plastic. You gently peel off that piece of plastic and you put another one down and it continues. So it's a very time intensive process. Okay. Um, is there any questions currently at this point that I could answer? Yes, Andrea, you can come. Andrea has a question. Uh, yes, I can. I would like to know what other kind of um, of resources would you recommend, except for the tactile ones? Um, well, there's there's many resources. So, um, you know, you can make things tactile. Anything that you can put together to make um the concept come together so and it doesn't even have to be anything big so you know you could cut out a piece of cardboard say you're doing moon phases and you could have the moon being held and you could have music or something auditory in the in front of the person and then you could have them turn different directions to figure out the different moon phases um we've done stuff with balls and string before to show how many times it takes you know the earth to go around and um whatever your concept is there's a whole bunch of stuff there's a lot of adaptive science equipment out there as well as far as talking um microscopes and tell there's different things you can do with telescopes to make them accessible for different heights and everything like that um there's also audio description or also called descriptive video and there's um a big company here in the united states called the audio description project and they've made a lot of science stuff accessible to both blind and deaf individuals um, through the use of audio description and closed captioning so is there something specific you're thinking about maybe i could um assist you with um i was thinking about the um, something with different temperatures i think we, um, we encountered this in another uh, presentation i'm not sure how uh, we can apply it in astronomy so at different temperatures it's it's great i mean because you could feel that the temperature of your you know current 
facility where you're at and you could put water in a bottle and the water could be water or colder than your room temperature and you could feel that sweat coming off and you could talk about how you know cloud formation is formed with that um, difference in temperatures um, there's always you know you can start a bunsen burner and they could hold their hand over top of the the flame and feel the heat coming off of that um, you can use dry ice um, to feel the real coldness say of of a planet. Um, and then obviously, you know, you could use different different textures. And you could say, you know, this this real smooth is because it's you know really cold here, or this real rough represents heat. Um, if you didn't want to use actual, if you didn't have the ability to use actual stuff like you know flame and dry ice, for example. Yeah, I think that's the safer way to handle that is just tactily. But yeah the, it all depends on the the age and and your facility you know the age of your participants and the facility that you're doing it at but be creative andra and and i also would say as far as i know maybe somebody else on this group chat knows uh there are no uh international standards like this texture represents a certain temperature uh unfortunately I think that would be nice to kind of stand. Yeah, that would be nice. As far as I'm aware, there's no standards in the Braille Authority of North America, which normally does, you know, work with other organizations in different countries and making standards with regards to Braille and tactile stuff has not created a standard for that. Um, so as far as I'm aware, there's no international standard. And maybe you could post to this group uh, some websites that uh, on accessibility in general. Yeah, I know I gave a whole bunch out to the rest of the moderators that they can go ahead and post in the chat, um, as well as we also have a universal design for learning um, article that I helped create um, that we will be sharing as well. Um, something else to make your stuff accessible is called Navi Lens. And Navi Lens is a nice free thing. I know we all love to hear free um, that allows you to give as much information as you want about a particular item, especially if it can't be felt. A lot of times it's used in signage um, with, you know, in cities, especially for their mass transit stuff, but it's also used in museums as well. And it kind of like a QR code idea. However, a QR code you normally have to be right on top of and scan, where the, the Navi lens, you could set it up to be 20 feet, 30 feet away. And as well, long as the person has this app on their phone, they will be able to view that, um, whatever that information is on that signage. Um, so they don't have to be right on top of it. And I see that David had shared that link for the Navi lens. So thank you, David. Ken, can you take just 30 seconds and tell us maybe how Navi lens might help us in our museums or classroom or? Sure. I mean, Navi lens is a great, great tool. Um, I think the best way that helps us in our museums is we have a lot of signage that describes about what's in front of you, especially for those items that we don't want to necessarily have touched that are either very delicate or, um, you know, have age to the point where handling is not a good thing. And so we have them behind glass. So how would a, a, a totally blind or even a low vision person see those? It'd be very difficult. So you're able to give exact descriptions of what the thing looks like without the person being able to touch it. And they can get the, still the full experience of somebody who's fully sighted um, seeing it. So Ken or, or David, how widely is uh, NaviLens used now? Has that been, is that really- been Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, NaviLens is used very widely over in Europe. Um, however, here in the United States, we're slow in accessibility. We always have been. 
I'm kind of jealous um, of Europe in that respect. They are, you know, in the forefront of accessibility, whether you're talking about building design, um, accessible pedestrian signals, audio description, closed captioning, you name it for whatever disability, they're in the forefront. So they've been using NaviLens over in Europe for a very long period of time now, um, in museums, in cities, for signage and for mass transit. And I know it's now coming over to the United States. There is a big cereal manufacturer that's going to be putting it on some of their cereal boxes starting next year. So you're going to start seeing this more widely used here in the United States, I'd say probably in the next probably three years. So is this something from the standpoint of I want I'm working with uh, existing outreach groups, you know, astronomy clubs, <laughs> where mm -hmm. they could make the signs and suggest to the people that are coming, if you haven't used NaviLens, get the app and- this Yes, mm -hmm. as long as you have a smartphone, there's a, a NaviLens for, you know, Android as well as iPhone. Um, you print out the sign with whatever information you want in that NaviLens code, just like you would with a QR code. And once they open up the Navi lens, they're able to see whatever's on that, you know, Navi lens. Um, because the way the app works, you it can see stuff from I believe twenty to thirty feet away, which is really nice because you can have sighted people standing right in front of your, you know, exhibit, and then the blind and visually impaired person could be standing fifteen feet away, looking at it, and they're not having to navigate through a whole bunch of people to get up close to see the exhibit. Sounds like something I'd like to use in crowded museums for myself. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those, you know, it was, you know, thought of for, you know, accessibility issues for those with visual impairments, but it's one of those universal design things, you know, it's, you make it for everyone and, you know, everybody can use it that way, even if you're only using it for, you know, a specific audience. Um, that's something that David and Cassandra and I have, found with the stuff we've done for NASA, we initially created the tactile books for the visually impaired and blindness communities, but we found that the deaf communities and the autistic communities have also um, really liked it because we use that universal design for learning um, thought process when creating them. And the regular ed students. It's yes. Everybody, mm -hmm. it's not just yes. for the blind and visually impaired. So this sounds like one of the things about um, accessibility here is that is that, and this is what we, you know, why this is so useful to us, Ken and David, is that people may see the resources and they want to do this, but they really don't know how to interact. This sounds like something that both could use in a way that they sort of get their own idea of what it's like to be relying on other things besides what they're used to seeing. Exactly. Yeah. And in a way to me, you know, I've, I had a teacher, she was a math teacher and she had gotten blind students kind of similar to the way David had. And she's like, how am I going to make, you know, she was teaching geometry and algebra too. She's like, how am I going to make this math stuff that's so visual, non-visual? Um, and this was, you know, in the seventies, early eighties. Um, when she got her first students. So there was not a lot of accessible stuff out there. Actually, in the 60s and 70s, if you were totally blind, um, in a lot of cases, you were expected to not even use Braille and use a typewriter to do all your work with. Um, so she figured out, hey, if I close my eyes, how am I going to teach this to my student? So that's what, you know, I'd recommend, you know, if you're trying to figure out how to do something, close your eyes and say, hey, how can I do this? Or if you want to be, you know, partially sighted, put on a pair of, you know, goggles that changes your, your vision ability. Um, you know, there, I know there's in the United States here, there's two major groups called the National Federation of the Blind and the American Council for the Blind. They also have um, other organizations similar to them in every single country. So that would be the best place for you to outreach to. Um, if you have questions about things, if you want to kind of demo something that you want to put out on exhibit and get really good, you know, user feedback on. So Ken, there's something that 
I learned about recently, and in fact, somebody else who's, who, who is at NASA and creates uh, resources learned about too in a session that we had, which is that it's not just not being able to see it at that moment. It makes a difference if you've never seen something. For example, oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, like the the people who uh, Andra uh, shared an experience where a blind person was under the tactile planetarium dome and said, oh, I didn't realize the sky was curved. And that's something that we would never realize uh, because we're used to it. The kind, Can you guys mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit? Things that... Yeah, it's called missed. like the... A professor that I went to, um, through a class with at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, Kentucky, called it the you know the spooniness of a spoon. So if you're only giving you know a cereal spoon, you and never seen any other type of spoon other than that, since you're you know visually impaired or blind, you're going to think every single spoon out there is you know metal and small and can only hold you know two pieces of cereal. But I mean, how many different types of spoons out there is there? There's, you know, slotted and different mixing spoons. And I mean, we probably could talk for hours about different spoons. So that's the same thing with pretty much anything that's, you know, gone through with the visual eye. I mean, 90% of learning is visual. So if you've never had any visual input, even from a young age, you're going to have a different aspect of what something looks like. Um, real good example of that is, um, part of my undergraduate work, um, I evaluated some tactile astronomy stuff with David. And in um, his book I brought up that he had created for his class was about Saturn. And I don't know if you remember this or not, David, but Saturn has rings. And in his book, it appears that the rings go through the planet versus around in one part of it. And he had never thought about it or seen it that way before. Yeah, that's uh, something I've learned from a neuroscientist that people who regain sight later in life can't interpret what they see. So much mm -hmm. of what we know is based on what we've seen since we were young. How can people recognize this? If you're doing outreach with people who are blind, <laughs> we know we're going to miss some things. Is How would you recommend going about... I mean, this is the kind of thing that makes people nervous and less mm -hmm. inclined to do this. How would we go about addressing these things and making sure that we're not talking about something that is a concept or an ideal that they've never seen before? Um, I guess I would give very detailed descriptions and I would ask, you know, does everybody understand this? What's, you know, when you start out, for example, you know, and you start talking about the moon, Hey, what what's your what do you think of when I say the moon? And everybody's, you know, if you can see it versus you can't see it, if you never felt a good tactile diagram of a moon before, you're all gonna have different ideas of what the moon looks like. So then you can go, oh, okay, well, this person thinks the moon is like a piece of cheese and has you know, Swiss cheese and has all holes in it. And then you can go from there talking about how the moon, you know, is like pretty much any of our, you know, planets or, you know, it has, you know, a surface and it has lots of, you know, valleys and craters and mountains and, and go from there. And then you could talk about how you can compare a mountain on earth to a mountain on the moon. Um, so, you know, I'll start that with very detailed description and then, you know, asking, don't be afraid to ask, you know, what's your experience? What do you know about, you know, this topic? Um, you have anything to input on with regards to that, David? No, I, I just agree. Evaluate often. Ask questions and see where your learner is and build from that. That's the key. It's a, there, it brings to mind an example of a friend who is teaching Tibetan monks about astronomy and she was talking about the moon and <laughs> landing on the moon and they were confused because it, they never, it, they didn't have a concept of the moon as a place. It was just a thing in the sky. They said, mm -hmm. what, it's a place you can go and stand on? So, you know, those are the assumptions that we make. 
Yeah, I'd say the worst thing you could do is assume that your, you know, your individuals that are coming to your event have a total knowledge of what you're talking about. So I think it's always good to, you know, ask and be very descriptive in your descriptions of what you're talking about, especially if it's something that they can't feel. Um, and everybody's, you know, life experience is going to play into that. I mean, I, I can't see it all. I've been totally blind, but I did have, you know, vision until about first grade. Mm. So I have some of that recall ability from, you know, preschool, kindergarten, first grade versus somebody who might have been totally blind since birth and never seen any colors or shapes or anything like that versus somebody who, you know, been sighted their whole life and just went blind because of diabetes, you know, four years ago. Um, so everybody's life experience is going to be different. Everybody's knowledge base is going to be better, different. So it's always just best to, you know, always ask. Um, worst thing you want to do is assume that they know what you're talking about and then to walk away with either a skewed idea of what your event and exhibit was about or be like, well, that was a waste of my time. And yes. this choice that I, if I can have another example, you know, never to underestimate the need to communicate. You know, we we uh, had a class uh, uh, with uh, blind people as Amateur Astronomers Association. And you know, one mm -hmm. great feedback we had at the end was from a participant who said that she finally understood what is a sunrise and what is a sunset. I mean, she was blind from uh, uh, birth, so she had never seen things like that. And uh, the way we did it was with the simple mechanical models. So not just tactile, and maybe that's another point to Ken where you may want to add some considerations, you know, moving parts, <laughs> things even simple that we made with the wood and the screws, you know, things like that, but that uh, reproduce the movements of the earth, uh, you know, and, 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 and things uh, uh, compared to the sun and so on. Things like that. Right, yeah, so, I mean, even with the, with the sunrise and the sunset, you could use, you know, like a, fa a flashlight and like, okay, you could feel the heat from the flashlight on your face, right? The sun just rose, you, you know, move it slowly yeah. away. And when you can't, okay, the sunset. Um, you know, and it, I saw something in the chat that just came across about, you know, planets, planets moving and you can, you know, do it different ways with somebody standing still and being planets and, revolving around each other um you know yeah. i know a lot of times people can't figure out what's hey how can you know earth be so close to the sun but you know venus be so cold um and david maybe you want to talk about our audible scale model that we've done well i was just going to mention we do have an audible scale model of our solar system that we wrote up that's very helpful in both understanding rotation revolution and the comparative distances in our solar system. We don't handle the size to scale by size, but we do to scale by distance. And it's an audible one, so they're hearing it as well as experiencing it. I know a lot of people are amazed by like, you need that much space to put it to scale. Um, and when we did this, you know, at an event we were in um, Louisville, Kentucky, and um, we said it, what was the sun was there and to, be ex to get all the way to Pluto, you would have had to go all the way back to Pennsylvania or something like that, David, I believe, for the, for the exact distance. Well, well, the mo our model, our audible scale our model. has the sun the size of a U.S. nickel <laughs> or a, a medium-sized marble. And at that scale, Pluto is 300, almost 300 meters away. Mm -hmm. We use feet, so 300 feet. That's the yep. length of a football field. <laughs> American football, though, in that case. <laughs> um, I did see something, somebody commented if, if that was a, available at all, David. Uh, yeah, uh, it is. I will have to find that and maybe I can get it to Mike. Mike, you can send it out to everybody. I, I, I mean, I have it written up, but I don't think it's like online anywhere. I'd have to dig for it. 
Well, I have two comments that come to mind. One is also, I'm always surprised by the ability of people who are blind. For example, I was going to respond to somebody in the chat here and then Ken did. And I realized, oh, he's reading the chat too. You know, I'm seeing it, but he's getting it too. And I think the math is a good example because I don't think math is visual. It, ha it has nothing to do with vision. It's just the way we make it. Astronomy is the same thing. Most of astronomy is things we can't see. We convert it into something visual. So you know, I, it's just the data and it can be yeah. done in other ways. Mike, I think it'd be very good for this group to hear from Wanda Yes, You know yep. Wanda, right? Yes, yes. Um, and she's the one who has... I've traveled with her in her home uh, area in Puerto Rico, and she was giving me directions about when to turn when yeah. we were driving. I told her she should probably drive then because she's. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that before too, and it, it kind of freaks people out. <laughs> it is very freaky, but you know, the, the, it, it's, I think <clears throat> Ken's point that blind people are not deaf. You don't have to yell at them. Okay, they're not dumb either. They're just as smart as everybody else, and they may be far more knowledgeable than you are, um, but they're missing some things. But, you know, my concern is I think that most of the people here, I know lots of people would like to do outreach with the, the blind and visually impaired, but are it's like going into... A, it's like going to a new country where you don't know how to behave properly. It's just mm -hmm. a matter of how to communicate. I'd say if you just treat your your blind and visually impaired audience as if they're normal, you'll be fine. Because um, we're no different than anybody else. We all have you know different likes, different you know same differences, different likes. Um, I mean, I myself, I wrestled in high school. I ran track. I was in the choir. Um, you know, so just, you know, I'm sure a lot of people on this call have done similar things in their life. Um, I'm blessed and I have a friend that allows me to do construction um, with him. So I've done, you know, everything underneath construction. Um, you know, you could think of it, I've probably done it electrical, plumbing, painting, drywalling, um, just to name a few. Um, and there's, you know, tons out there. There's somebody on YouTube called the Blind Woodsman, and he deals with, you know, big table saws and everything, and they, he can't see at all. Um, and I believe he's over in England. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the, another thing that I think is a good example, too, that I've learned about recently with the, uh, the J West uh, telescope images and the descriptive... Uh, mm -hmm captions that were made is that and i think this is this is applicable to what we're doing in describing things in detail that the captions that i would write for an image don't work for blind people it, because it doesn't have the detail that we need you you want to talk about how that process perhaps can you repeat that mike well, the the captions for the the J West uh, tele space telescope images, the mm -hmm. descriptive captions, as well as the the uh, audio captions, are not what I would write ordinarily. That gives additional information. It goes into detail about things that I would never consider, and it seems mm -hmm. like that's the same kind of a process that you need to get across things that sighted people wouldn't need to know in those details um yeah you're you're right about that but i mean with regards to captioning um or even doing alt text say on your website you want to put you know what's most important so say for example you have a picture and it has a desk and somebody's sitting at it and you know they're in a suit and they have you know a whole bunch of stuff on it you'd only want to point out the most you know, important details in that picture if you're doing, you know, an alternate text of that picture. Um, when it comes to describing, especially if you're describing action, you want to be as detailed as possible, um, you know, and the audio describers that do it for a living do a great job at doing it. Um, and when it's involved with a production such as um, currently working with a production called Big Astronomy Project, 
and it's been created both for flat screen as well as for the dome. And we're currently audio describing that right now. And so the descriptions of what happens on screen will come in the normal pauses of the dialogue and the sound of the soundtrack. And depending on how your system's set up depends on how you'd be able to use that. You could either come at, have it come out through your house audio and everybody could hear it, um, which there's nothing wrong with that because it's been proven that even totally sighted people can't see everything that's going on you know, in front of them. So they miss out on stuff. So the audio description allows um, for them to get what they've missed. Um, it was kind of an interesting study that I saw that um, pointed that out. So it's a nice accident for a universal design. No, that's so even another way to do that would be if to have you know a pair of headphones on, and the audio description track would just be coming through those headphones, um, and then the rest of the audio would be coming out through your house system. But that depends on how your house is set up and what your ability is like for you know production. Um, I know there's you know also closed captions. They normally come out on the screen. And there's currently several focus groups right now that are trying to figure out what's the best way to do that in, especially in a planetarium setting, because there's a lot of concern about when you're putting text up on the dome, how distracting is that? Well, we all uh, miss things in the, uh, in movies, people say, did you notice such and such? And, and the answer is no. But uh, astronomy example is that those of you who may be doing outreach with telescopes and if you're doing things with faint objects or even with the planets that are bright, you're, mm -hmm. you frequently have to guide people to see the details that they don't see automatically because they're not used to that kind of observing and that you can get them to see much more by telling them what to look for. Mm hmm um, you know, also with that is, you know, you can use different textures to show the different brightnesses of those, those planets and stars, you know, you could use a really big bead for, a, you know, a star that's really close and really bright and a, a smaller bead to show the different faintness of, you know, the star, mm -hmm. um, same difference with, you know, textures of planets, smooth and, and rough, you know, a planet has like Saturn has rings used, you know, something smooth for the planet and then something rough to, you know, delineate that, you know, there's rings that go around this planet. Um, I saw something in the chat with, you know, differences between somebody who's had sight for a while. Um, versus somebody who's, you know, had no sight at all versus somebody like myself and kind of asking those questions, you know, what do you think about when you, when I say the color blue or the color green, what is your, you know, reference point? Um, and then I could say, well, when, when I'm green, I think about you know, the grass, when I'm blue, I think about, you know, you know water or the sky or um, different things like that that they can relate it to. I was asking this because I was actually asked by a 13 year old girl, mm -hmm. what is the color red? How can I describe to her so that she can understand the color red? And I was and she, unable to- She's had no, she's had no sight since birth, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, that's, that's a really hard one. Um, I would say like the color red is something that is warm or hot, kind of like, um you know fire you know it's really bright um it, it's kind of hard without having a base it was very difficult because we were talking yeah. about stars how uh, red ones are, are colder and i couldn't even uh, um well i guess with red ones being colder you could like have something that's smoother to show that it's like cooler. So like maybe something like um, like a piece of overhead projection film from like an overhead projector um, would be maybe something nice and smooth or even some glue that you put on a piece of paper that's you know really smooth and then 
um, have something that's textured that, you know, that would be for a different color other than red. Um, okay. Otherwise, I'd just describe it as being, you know, real hot, intense um, type of deal like that if you're actually talking about the color. Okay. Would the analogy with the sound and frequencies uh, be useful or it would be confusing? It would be it would be useful. However, I would have to say it does take a little bit of training to use um, sonification. Sonification is a great tool. I've used it and I've been trained in it very quickly. Um, the first time I actually laid hands on sonification was actually at a conference in a in a hallway. And so you know, just imagine, you know, busy conference and then people walking past you in a hallway and learning sonification. Um, I learned it very quickly, very easily, but then again, it goes back to the ability of the person. So some people might take a little bit more to get used to that, but it's a very good tool and it would be useful for that as well. Um, Cesare, could you remind me about the question you posed in the chat a few minutes ago? I saw it come up, but I don't remember the exact question. Yeah, sure. It's about uh, uh, if you could share some advice on how to best guide the tactile exploration of an object. I know it's not just grab and the head and pull it on. <laughs> right. So um, especially if you know it's not labeled, what normally somebody who does that's exploring a tactile object when they're handed to it they'll explore the whole thing they'll do it from top to bottom from left to right um, at first so if you're giving you know detailed you know um, descriptions of it say you're looking at the planet earth um, and you're wanting them to follow you know the continents or whatever you could say starting at the 12 o'clock position is australia if you go down to the six o'clock position it's you know, the Netherlands or however you have your map laid out. So giving exact detailed description of how your map's laid out, what they're feeling, um, you know, the rougher stuff that you're feeling are mountainous regions and the continents, the smoother areas are bodies of water, which are the oceans, for example. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. So that was a great question. So thanks for asking it. And regarding uh, sonification, I've heard many of these things. They mean absolutely nothing to me. I mean, I've tried listening without looking at the object, and I can't. Mm -hmm. I can see where the 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 data is encoded, but <clears throat> I, I I can't create the image in my mind in any way. But I would like to understand that better so that I'm better able to use it with other people. What mm -hmm. do you guys recommend for those of us who want to use it and want to get some idea of what the experience I know NASA has produced a lot of sonification stuff and has stuff out there about it. But basically, the higher pitched sound that it goes up is the higher the, you know, the arc of what you're plotting. And as it comes down, it goes in lower pitch. And as it you know settles out, you hear that settling out. So you can hear the differences in the in the slopes and everything. Mm -hmm. um, same thing if you're using it to depict, you know, star fields. You know, you can have it. You have it set. You know, the higher the frequency is, the brighter the star, and the lower the frequency is. You know, the less brightness of the star, and you know. Somewhere in the middle is, you know, middle brightness. That that I can get, but that's one dimensional. But then when there's, it's two dimensional, like a planet, and I just mm -hmm. start hearing more. I can't decipher all the different sounds together. Yeah, it's a it's a little bit harder, and that sometimes you need, you know, guidance the first time as far as okay, what are these sounds actually referring to? Are the louder sounds for mountainous regions and the lower sounds for, you know, the valleys or, you know, volcanoes or what are they actually representing? Um, and then once you learn that for one planet, then you can, you know, move that onto another planet. And that's all normally set up by whoever's producing the sonification. So your sonification could be totally different than my sonification. Oh, that makes it 
a little harder, but we'll have to try. Thanks, David. Any other questions? Yeah, so I was just going to ask if there's any other questions in the chat that we maybe missed or anything that has come up that people want to ask. Um, uh, so Christine or Cesare, are you going to mention some notes? Oh, there you go. All right. All right. So if there is, there are no questions anymore. Um, all right. So that ends our presentation for today. And Again, thank you very much for attending this webinar. And of course, thank you, Ken and David, uh, for your presentation for today. Um, so this, uh, this webinar will be uploaded in our YouTube channel. So watch out for that. And then um, a call to action. Um, you can find our tools and good practices for our sub-working group uh, in this, uh, in this um in this link and we will chat all the links later. And of course, if you haven't joined our community in FD group, uh, you may join. Uh, you can also find it here uh, at facebook.com slash groups slash IEU inclusive outreach. And then um, actively contribute to our working group with your skills and time. You can click, um, you can click the link here also. And of course, uh, you can also participate to the mentoring mentorship program in collaboration with um, Astronomy for Equity. So uh, Mike here is the founder of Astronomy for Equity. Um, Mike, would you like to share um, some information about uh, the organization? Yeah, so in general, Astronomy for Equity is to use astronomy to help those who do not have opportunities. There are a lot of different uh, ways in which this is the case, but uh, we also have a program for um, uh, getting out these resources that Daniel, uh, David and Ken and so many others have, and the expertise that Andra and uh, Diana and, and others here <clears throat> have in doing this. Uh, there's no lack of resources and there are volunteers around the world with activities already and outreach who would very much like the opportunity to be more inclusive. So we have done one, we'll start again very soon, a community process by which we bring the experts, the resources and the learners together so that they can learn. This is a follow-up essentially to uh, what we're doing here, just the idea on how to do this and some mentoring and handholding and social interaction so we can all get comfortable with it. There's no reason why we can't all have our outreach activities be inclusive to those who are ordinarily not included. There's plenty out there. So we will send a follow-up uh, email uh, about that before long too. And I hope uh, many of you will wanna participate. All right, uh, thank you, Mike. So uh, the, the links uh, for the call to action are posted in the chat, so you may uh, see the uh, links there. And uh, before we end, um, can we have a group photo? If you're comfortable opening your camera, that is. So feel free to open your camera for a group uh, photo. Okay, so I'll count to three and then I'll, I'll switch on. Right. Mm -hmm. um, one, two, three. three. All right, uh, thank you very much, everyone. And hope you have a, hope you uh, learned something new today. And hope to see you again to our next webinar. Um, all right, so good night, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And um, yeah, have a, 
fruitful day ahead of you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Ken. Thank you. Bye. Bye.